morning, everyone. This is Veronda Pitchford. I'm the Director of Membership at Development and Resource Sharing here at Rails. Thank you so much for joining us. Um, I want to please, I, I put this in the chat box. Please feel free to ask your questions. I'll be trying monitoring that throughout the session. I want to introduce you to our, our first presenter, uh, Jamie Dickinson. He's the Director of Library Relations at Bibliolab. Um, as many of you may be familiar with BiblioBoard, which is produced by BiblioLabs, it's the geolocated platform that all Rails members have access to right now, and we have pop-up picks and recovering the classics on it. But BiblioLabs is a company that's been a great partner to Rails, and with the kind of partnership and work we're doing with them, Rails members are the first in the country to have access to it. I just want to really quickly say the goal of today's webinar is to deepen uh, library engagement with com libraries engagement with the community. We're already great rock stars in community engagement, but the resources uh, we're going to learn about today from uh, fellow Rails members and Jamie will help uh, deepen that engagement in a virtual age. Um, I think I hope many of you know that it's always Rails' uh, prime directive to position libraries as the rock stars of their community. And we see this as an opportunity to deepen connections to with residents in your community, deepen connections with information, and of course, quality content that may be from your neighbors. So as people shop local, eat local, that they can use the library as a portal to live local and read local. Uh, I also want to, and they'll speak uh, immediately uh, after Jamie, or in between, and two of our fabulous Rails members, uh, Jeffrey Fisher, who's the Studio Services Manager at Fountaindale Public Library. And if you're not familiar with uh, the Studio 300, he'll be talking a little bit about that, and I already encourage you to visit it. And also, uh, Michelle Rubel, who's the Head of Reference and Reader Services at Plainfield Public District Library. And what they'll be doing is telling you about their experience with deepening community engagement with writers and the successes they've had in that. Again, ask any questions that you have. Uh, we'll keep an eye on them, and I'll do my best to get them in as soon as as soon as soon uh, Jamie gives me a chance. Jamie, we should have like a safe word so that you can <laughs> stop talking so I can speak if I have a question. So if I say Dewey Decimal, then you know there's a question, okay? Yeah. Okay, that's our secret. That's the Pee Wee Herman word of the day. So uh, Jamie, why don't you take it away and uh, then we'll hear from uh, Jeffrey and Michelle briefly. So thank you. Awesome. Thanks, Veranda, and thank you, everybody, for attending. I'm looking forward to meeting all of you and telling you a little bit about some of the things that we're doing at Bibliolabs. But I'd like to start with um, saying that I, I am a frequent library user, and I love the library. I'm sure that uh, you guys hear that quite a bit, but I, I visit every day. I've got a son that goes to school right across the street from my office, and we have um, the main branch of the Charleston County Public Library is two doors down, so we're pretty fortunate in that. And every day at 3 o'clock, I get him, and we walk down to the library. And I, I never cease to be amazed by the energy and the support that libraries are providing to their patrons, particularly the, the younger patrons that I see coming in, because that's what I see most. And it's crazy. I mean, if any of you guys are in the library when school gets out, which I'm sure you are, it's just, um, I call it the witching hour. I, I don't know how everybody handles all of that. I can barely manage two on my own. but. Um, I have a great experience at the library, and I love it. And but I also have to admit that I'm I'm a relatively new frequent library user. Um, I, I worked at Amazon for ten years, and I joke that um, they did everything they could to keep me out of the library. But uh, but frankly, my kids got me going again. And I have to say that the library is completely different, at least in my perspective, than it used to be. You know, it's uh, there's no shushing. Uh, there's great programming, um, lots of fun educational things, not just for my children, but for me and my wife and our family. Um, it is um, really a, an awesome place. And, and what struck me is that, you know, 
just because it was different, the reality is, is that change in the library is nothing new. Um, the library is simply doing what it's always done, and that's adapting to the needs of the community it supports. So I, I agree completely with what, what Veranda said, that you guys are all rock stars and doing incredible things um, as at, with community engagement and with just adapting to the needs that the, the community has. So um, as I think about the impact that the digital age is having on libraries, I, I think it's fair to say that we're in the middle of a transitional period. So libraries are adapting and figuring out how to adapt and, quite frankly, how to compete because you have to face it, right? There's there, Libraries have competition in the likes of Amazon, Apple, and Google when it comes to providing content for patrons. So how do libraries compete? You know, it's, it, some, some folks that I talk to think that they're going to double down on efforts to increase collections. Um, but most of the most of the libraries that I talk to um, kind of tend to agree with what, what Library Transform says, which I, I really like, which the libraries today are less about what they have for people and more about what they do for people. It seems like the focus is shifting um, from building just simply building collections to, to building a place where you can build communities. So I, our chief business officer is a guy named Mitchell Davis. And he had an interview with Sari Feldman um, from Cuyahoga Library and American Library Association. And I think Mitchell's quote sums up pretty good, summed it up pretty good um, with this quote that the reality is that a corporation like Amazon and Apple, while they may be competing with libraries, can never care and connect with a, a local community the way library will. So, so let's talk about communities a little bit. I, I don't know if any of you are familiar with a, a guy named David Lanks, but David lives in my home state of South Carolina. He's currently the director of the um, University of South Carolina School of Library and Information Science. And he wrote a, an award-winning book called The Atlas of New Librarianship. And he's a passionate advocate for libraries and their essential role in today's society. He, he has a quote that I love, which I think really resonates, um, and that is, Bad libraries only focus on building collections. Uh, good libraries build services, and great libraries build communities too. So, you know, obviously we have to focus on building collections. I get that, but there's also this growing trend toward building services and building communities. So, it sounds sounds cool, and uh, I, I've been amazed at, at all of the cool things that I've seen when it comes to building communities um, in within the library. Whether it's working with local authors. Um, local musicians and artists or focusing on oral histories or archives, you know, it, it seems like the sky is the limit. So uh, it's been really impressive. It's been a great thing to see. And I know that many of you on the call are also doing some great things. And, and I'm, I'm pleased to know that we've been working with Michelle and Jeffrey um, and their libraries. And I, I know that you guys are really doing some, some great things, some exciting things. And Veronda mentioned Studio 300 just a minute ago, so I think I'll turn it over to Jeffrey, and Jeffrey, you can give us an idea of what you're doing. Uh, thank you, Jamie. Appreciate that, uh, and thank you, Veranda, too, as well, and Rails for hosting this. I'm sorry I couldn't be there in person today, but uh, we can certainly uh, uh, talk about what we're doing uh, at Fountaindale Public Library in Bolingbrook, Illinois, and at Studio 300. Uh, as Veranda mentioned, uh, it's worth coming out to see Studio 300. I think it's uh, definitely one of the premier digital media labs at Makerspaces here in Chicagoland. Uh, definitely worth the trip. Uh, and for years since we started the, uh, the studio aspect of the library, our focus has always been to provide the resources uh, that our patrons need to tell their own stories. Uh, so whether they're preserving uh, parts of their life, curating that, uh, creating new things, and ultimately sharing that, uh, that's really been our focus. And uh, if you want to kind of see some of the things that we've been doing and continue to do, you can see us at uh, studio300.org. That takes you to our blog. And what's happened over the years is our patients have created and continue to create an amazing array of both personal and professional content using the equipment and production spaces and resources that we have in Studio 300 and at the Fountaindale Library. Um, they produce things, uh, audio and music production, things like podcasts and uh, a variety of different uh, music genres that come in, uh, people doing audio books too as well. Uh, we have a lot of videos being made, uh, music videos, uh, training videos, uh, product videos. A uh, bunch of YouTubers that use what we do. 
and uh, photography, graphic design, 3D design, printing, really just a, a wide range of things that our patrons are doing. Uh, and that's been going very, very well for a, a long time. And we've been successful at that since uh, about 2013. And so one of the things that always kind of played in the back of my mind is what would be the next step? We, we really spend our focus on getting those resources together, and we continue to do that and, and train our, our patrons and, and helping them to explore and, and learn what they need to do uh, to tell their own stories. But what would be the obvious next step? And for us, that really meant kind of capturing and curating and sharing the media that our patrons produce, their music, their videos, their photos, their graphic designs. But how do we really do that? And that's always been something I've thought about. We've been established for a while. We're still moving in lots of different directions. But what is that next step for Studio 300? A few years ago, I ran across Library U, which is at Escondido, California Library. And their concept was that they would recognize local knowledge and make it available to library patrons uh, right alongside the, the library's other content. So patrons made videos and podcasts and books about a variety of topics like gardening and green cleaning. And that material appears uh, in the pack along with all of the other uh, elements that are available at the library. I thought, that's a really cool idea. And then I also, around the same time, ran across uh, Madison Public Library's project they called the Yahara Music Project, which is where they bring in uh, local musicians. And local musicians submit their music, their albums, and then that's available for their patrons with their library cards to download. And I thought, wow, that's absolutely terrific. That's exactly what I would like to bring to our patrons in Bolingbrook, to find a way for them to share their knowledge, share their artistic creations with the whole Fountaindale community. And so, of course, we started doing this in a very ad hoc way, you know, posting articles here and there, and pictures on the Flickr account, uh, videos on our blog and YouTube channel, and hanging someone's artwork up in the lab. It was all very, very ad hoc uh, for quite a while. Another driving factor for us, though, also, is as part of our strategic plan, one of the goals we were charged with was to establish a self-publication service. Uh, but for us, that self-publishing part was not really clearly defined. Uh, many people, of course, associate that term with books. But we decided to take a much broader perspective to include all locally produced content by and for our patrons, regardless of whatever media they were using. So this directive mean means that uh, we needed to craft a formal approach to gathering and presenting this content, and we needed to find that platform. And, you know, putting it up on Flickr and YouTube and SoundCloud and all those different places like that was a very uh, you know, scattershot way to do this. Really wanted a central platform. And that's when I saw the demo of BiblioBoard, and I thought, this is, this is actually the platform that we're going to need. Um, so we've uh, started now. We're in the very early stages of, of doing this, working on planning our policy and the procedures and how we're going to collect that information that, and, and things that our patrons make, and then use the BiblioBoard community engagement tools to really share that with the community. So we're working on promotion uh, initially here to uh, get our patrons to submit their content. We'll be building web pages, other resources, holding programs that support what our patrons are going to need. Uh, I'm really in, enthused about streamlining the submission process, making it very easy for our patrons to submit their content so that there's no um, real barriers to doing that. And then ultimately getting the information that we need so that the, the right information, the, the mark-like record information would end up um, getting acquired from the patrons and get that into the pack so that their content will appear right along all the other content resources that we offer here. Uh, and then get ready to launch it, really promote it. And we're uh, planning a large launch event. Uh, so uh, have uh, all of the people who have submitted kind of get together in, in one big giant patron showcase. So we're looking forward to that as well. Uh, we're also going to integrate Selfie, but I'll leave that for Michelle to talk a little bit about. So I'll kind of skip that too as well. Uh, so for us, we're, we're planning on doing a music project for our local bands, uh, kind of uh, in the way that Louisville and St. Louis and Madison are doing. I know Jamie will talk about that in a little bit. Uh, also collecting all the other things that our patrons make, whether it's videos, photos, graphic design, and all that stuff. So we're really excited to see this content to be really side by side with all the other resources. And for Studio 300, really, we have the tools, we have the staff uh, to help the patrons uh, really take their material to the next level, whether that's uh, finishing off a book, or, or preparing a photograph for upload, and then doing that work to, to get it into the BiblioBoard platform using the Creator Project. So uh, we're excited about that. Uh, as a side note, the Fountain Dale staff, uh, we're also excited about some of the things we can do with the platform in terms of preserving our local history, oral history, some of the things that Jamie mentioned. Uh, we got a ton of ideas. And, and now I think we have that final platform that's going to make these ideas uh, quite viable. So I think, as you can tell, I am very excited to be moving in this direction here at the Fountain Dale Public Library and that uh, we're planning on rolling out here in the early summer and, and have our launch event in the fall. So uh, we're really, really excited about that. Yeah.
That's awesome, Jeffrey. It's it's um, we're we're incredibly excited about it too, and that uh, we can. Like I mentioned this yesterday, but uh, everybody in in our office is excited about the project that you have going on over there. So thank you for everything you're doing, Michelle. Do you want to tell us a little bit about um, about Selfie and the the writing um, the writing pro programs that you have? Hey, this is Veranda. Just really quick, something, and Michelle is re at the ready. Yeah. She's just giving me two seconds of her very valuable <laughs> platform. I just wanted to say one thing I forgot to mention is part of the partnership we have with BiblioLab, uh, Rails has with BiblioLab, is that all the products and things you're going to see today are available to Rails members at a deep discount. And if you want to get a quote, and you'll be hearing about selfie, and Creator and Pressbooks specifically are the three products that Jamie will talk about at the end if we learn a little bit more about community engagement tools and seeing some best practices. So definitely, um, we'll put, Amanda will put her email in the chat so that everyone can see it and just let us know. And again, I think you'll be very impressed with the pricing. So thank you, Michelle, for the time, your time. And for doing those. <laughs> oh, my pleasure. Um, hi, I'm Michelle from Plainfield. And um, we actually have a service community that's larger than Fountaindale's, but we have a much smaller budget and a much smaller library. We have a library that's about 26,000 square feet and a population of 75,000 district um, members. And so we have struggled with how to meet all the various demands of our public. And one thing that we have wanted to do, at least since I started there almost 10 years ago, is do something a little bit more for local writers and content creators as social media has grown, et cetera. And so we saw um, Biblio Board as one piece in allowing us to do this. Um, our approach is really holistic. Uh, we do a variety of programs. And we try to do at least one program a month that's either an author, an author talk, a book discussion, or signing, or something about um, writing, maybe a program on character development, or poetry writing, or outlining your novel. And in addition to those kind of monthly programs, uh, we also have a writer's group that meets the third Tuesday to share what they're writing. And then we've done a couple larger programs. Um, we took part in Indie Author Day for the um, first time this year uh, in, uh, on October 8th. And we had a day-long um, program with an author panel of local and traditional and self-published authors from the area. And they did a Q&A. And then we had an author fair. Uh, with about 15 different local authors who write everything from fiction to romance, children's. And then um, we uh, broadcast the digital gathering with industry leaders, which was a joint project with LJ and Self-E. And uh, that was very successful. We had about um, 40 or so attendees. And um, one of our Instagram posts was picked up by the national NaNoWriMo um, page. And our local author was so thrilled for the promotion um, on a national level from something that she did at her local public library. So that's the kind of, of thing that really inspires us to do more. We also are very invested in promoting um, NaNoWriMo, National Novel Writing Month. We do program for Camp NaNoWriMo in the spring and um, summer. We do an introduction to Come Right In, which is the program for libraries and other locations to actually uh, create space and promote NaNoWriMo to their community. Uh, we do about uh, 12 or 15 different um, write-in opportunities at the library. Everything from just a quiet writing room to um, writing game sessions, like writing prompts, to author-led uh, sessions. We also take part in our regional 
uh, NaNoWriMo, which is NaperWriMo. And through them, uh, 15 local libraries are part of a library crawl where we create a card that you can pick up at any one of these writing sessions. And then when you go to the Thank God It's Over party, uh, which is the first week in December, it's a big potluck. There are all sorts of um, free drawings and prizes. And it's really just a chance to celebrate your, your writing success. So in, a, in addition to programs, we also uh, make sure that our print collections and our online collections uh, are targeted to support this audience. Uh, we don't have large budget, but we do try to buy books from Writer's Digest. We also get Writer's Digest magazine. And two books I would suggest for your reference collection if you have limited resources are Writer's Market and Novel and Short Story Writer's Market. In terms of online sources, um, we do a lot with social media, and we do have a Pinterest um, NaNoWriMo board. Um, if you go to Pinterest.com slash Plainfield, LIB is our handle there. And so you can see a lot of different links that we've pulled together. Um, we also offer uh, Gale courses, which the public knows as Ed2Go. And through Gale courses, you can take a lot of different classes, everything from like writing essentials and grammar refresher to keys to effective editing, research methods for writers, writerific creative training for writers. And then through lynda.com, which is another um, online resource, uh, they have things from writing headlines, speech writing, learn to write a syllabus, writing ad copy, writing technical reports. Um, and we also partner with um, Will County Workforce Services, and they send every Wednesday their mobile lab where they have someone on board that will help with resume writing and cover letter writing. So we try to approach not only the creative writers, but people that might have to write for business, write for school, um, write to get a job, and we, we try to cover all of those bases. Um, in addition uh, to those kinds of classes, we also have Help Now, which is a BrainFuse product where you can 24-7 submit via an upload your writing sample and get live assistance or extended analysis and targeted feedback. It might, if you do it in the middle of the night, you're not going to necessarily get it right then, but they, they do um, offer like a 24-hour turnaround. And finally, Self-E which was attractive to us because, again, we have very limited space and limited money. And what can we do to meet the needs of local authors that would like their material in the library? And this was what was really appealing to me about Selfie because I could offer my local authors a way to upload their content and make it available not only in my library, but in libraries across Illinois, and were their books to be chosen um, through the LJ selection process, they might even have national reach. Um, there's no cost to the author, and nor, do, uh, nor are there any royalties. So it's more of a discovery platform and less of a way to um, make money through Selfie itself. However, it's a great marketing tool, and it can lead to sales through other channels. And since you retain you're right, since the license is non-exclusive, you can publish elsewhere. So I think for like an unknown person who's just doing their first book, this is a way to make it available to thousands of readers through public libraries. Um, and even if you're already self-published, uh, it is a way, a free way to get into libraries. And sometimes if you're traditionally published, you might also own electronic rights. And this is another way to get into libraries. So um, it's a very simple program. There are three different formats. And I'll let Jamie talk more about that. Uh, but I would highly recommend if you're in a situation where you really want to be able to promote um, local authors and adding them to your collection, this is a really easy way to do it when you're short on manpower and short on dollars. Thanks. Thanks so much, Michelle. That's awesome. I think between you and Veranda, you guys 
might need to be evangelist for the program. We'll, we'll send you around. <laughs> Consider it done. Yeah. Right. Yeah. You mentioned in the author day too. That's that is such a it's an interesting program. We we um, at Biblio Labs we we had some early ad, uh, adopters of our program with Selfie, and what we used to do is we travel around and we go to these um, author events in the individual libraries. And as we started to get a little bit bigger, um, we thought it would be interesting to do a um, a more national event, and so. Uh, we decided to just host a day, and we chose October 8th, which we realized, unfortunately, too late that that's Canadian Thanksgiving, so we, we're not doing that again this year, but uh, we picked a day where we do just a big hosted indie author day and have many libraries participate, and it was a success. We're doing that again this year, and for anybody that wants any information on that, I can send out the date um, pretty, I, I can send it to you. I, I don't know off the top of my head, but it's in October. I think it's October 17th, but... Anyway. And also, Rails, Rails is a partner on Indie Author Day, so we publicize it through the Rails e-news as it approaches. So you'll definitely yeah. see more about it. I'm sure we'll be partnering again this year. Yeah, we'd love that. Yeah. Um, so on, on to authors, we Michelle just gave a, a, some great information about how to support local authors, as did Jeffrey. And um, I'm... I'm sure that I, I've said jokingly how many you guys probably never have any authors come into the library, right? You probably don't have any authors in the community. Um, I, I know that they're coming in, and I know that they are um, interested in, in having their books um, discovered, and they think the library is a great place to do that. As do I. I mentioned earlier that I worked at Amazon, and I was there for ten years. I was in um, what what Amazon refers to as indie publishing or self publishing. So. I was with Kindle Direct Publishing and CreateSpace. Uh, I was there in 2005 when I think self-publishing was still pretty much considered uh, vanity press. But things have changed, right? More and more people are self-publishing, and it's really become mainstream. Uh, it's something that I'm pretty proud of in my time there that I was a part of that. Um, so I, I have a pretty good idea about how many books are being published these days, and it's, it's quite a bit. And I also know that these authors are coming in the library. That the first uh, photo here on this slide is a guy named Hugh Howey. Um, he wrote a book called Wool, and, and you, most of you probably know who Hugh is, but it, it never ceases to surprise me that there are many people that don't know about Hugh. I mean, after all, he sold millions and millions of copies of his books. He sold the print rights to this book, Wool, to Simon & Schuster for seven figures, and um, he did something pretty groundbreaking at the time when he signed the deal with Simon, and that is that he retains all of the digital rights for his for the book Wool, as well as all of his other books. So, um, what you he also sold the the uh, movie rights to uh, 20th Century Fox, and I think Ridley Scott was last I heard was going to turn Wool into a movie, which I think would be fantastic. Um, but what you might not know about Hugh is that he's a self-published author. So um, he um, he used to be one of those authors that would walk into the library and say, hey, put this book on my shelf. He's still a self-published author. He's what we call a hybrid author, meaning that some of his books are traditionally published, but the others he's continuing to end or self-published, just like the e-book of Wool. Uh, that's where he has the biggest opportunity to earn. Um, he he self-published with CreateSpace, and when that, he happened to do that at the time that I was there. And I got to know Hugh and spend a little bit of time with him. But one of the things that struck me is that I realized that there are folks like Hugh all over the all over the country, right? And and they're not just in big towns; they're in little towns too. So Hugh was in living in a place called Boone, North Carolina, which is a small town in North Carolina. And he was working at a Barnes and Noble, painting houses, trying to make ends meet, and writing. And um, you know now he's rich and sailing sailing around the world on a sailboat. But he, he is um, a success story. And the publishing has become easier and easier over the years, particularly since the time that I started at Amazon until now. The, the piece that's missing is exposure. These authors are, def, are desperate to get that exposure. And you know, at, at BiblioLabs, we think, why not the library to help the author get exposure? After all, who's better at connecting a reader and a writer than a librarian? Uh, the, the the next lady that's on this slide is um, her name is Elle Penelope. Her name's Leslie. 
Her pen name is El Penelope, and she wrote a book called Song of Blood and Stone, and she worked with her public library in Harford County, Maryland, uh, to make the book available to local patrons through, through the selfie program. She also entered a, a, in a book contest run by, by the Black Caucus of the ALA, and she won that contest. And most recently, she just signed a four-book deal with St. Martin's Press. So this is a, a real success story. And I, I think for Leslie, it was certainly about exposure, um, but it was more than just exposure. What the library afforded her was an opportunity to meet her career objectives as a professional writer. And that's just a fantastic story of how a library engaged a, an author in their community and helped, um, helped her succeed. Uh, there are also other ways to help authors succeed. There's statewide contests, and I know in Illinois there's a contest soon to be famous, um, which you guys are all familiar with, and uh, or I think you're probably all familiar with. Um, this is a great program. There are just there are amazing indie books out there that are just waiting to be discovered. I mentioned how easy it is to publish these days. I went to, uh, I gave a presentation at the State Library of South Carolina a couple weeks ago, and I heard a statistic at that presentation that uh, there were greater than 800,000 books were published last year, which is staggering. But frankly, I, I think that number is probably pretty conservative. Uh, when I was at Amazon, we were doing 1,500 indie books every week. Um, and I know that number's grown uh, since I left, but the sheer the sheer number of books that are being published is uh, it creates both risk and opportunity for librarians. Right? There's there are great books out there, but there's also a ton of books out there. So how do you know which ones are the good ones and which ones aren't? And programs like Soon to Be Famous help with this. Um, there are also other services available to help you identify the good books, like Selfie. I think that's a good example, and we'll talk a little bit more on the details of selfie in a minute. But another statistic that I, that I heard that I find interesting when it comes to indie books is that last year, of all the best-selling books on Amazon, less than 50% of those were from the big five publishing houses. The remainder of those books were indie books, with the majority of those being self-published. Um, another statistic that I find interesting is that of the millions of urban fiction books sold, only 4% of those were from the big five. So this means to me that there are great books out there that people aren't discovering in their library if their library isn't working with indie authors and supporting indie authors. Uh, they're having to go elsewhere to find these fantastic books, and it sounds like they are going elsewhere to find those books. So. Um, there are authors in your community, and, and there are programs that exist to help those authors. There's also there are also musicians in your community. Jeffrey talked about um, the program Studio 300, looking to engage um, the musical community, and mentioned these two libraries as examples. That there's St. Louis uh, County Library, and there's Louisville Free Library. They put together some pretty interesting programs. Louisville did the Louisville Mix, and St. Louis's program is called Listen Up STL. And they reached out to their community and said, we want your music collections. Uh, we want to make those available to our patrons. If you're interested in doing this and getting exposure for your work, please let us know. And the outcome was amazing. Combined, they have greater than 3,000 songs in these collections. Um, they had very successful launch parties where folks got to come and listen to live music and meet the musicians and, um, and all very successful way to engage the musical community um, in Louisville and St. Louis. There also are um, other, you know, aside from authors and musicians, there are also um, oral histories. You know, there, there are stories to be told in, in every community regardless of the size of that community. I, I agree with Veranda's thoughts that the, the library is the story core of the community. I think I'm going to continue to use that and maybe start taking credit for it instead of giving that to Veranda, but it is, um, the library is a place where stories um, can be told, they can be stored, they can be shared. Uh, for example, there is, um, at Eastern New Mexico University at Golden Library, they've had a program that's been ongoing to preserve the rich history of diverse cultures that inhabit Eastern New Mexico. So starting in the early 70s, professors at the university worked alongside amateur oral historians in the community 
and began conducting these oral history interviews. And the collection now includes interviews that focus on a wide variety of topics, including women's rights, uh, Native American culture and history, stories from World War I and World War II veterans. Um, the list goes on and on. Um, Grafton Midview Public Library in Ohio also has an oral history program, and uh, they're focused on stories uh, from their community remembering a time past, uh, remember, remembering about specific places and times and how they've changed. Um, those can happen in any community. So I think both of these collections are kind of windows into the community and the details that the history books can't always tell. Uh, there also are archives. So uh, not far from Illinois and Michigan, there's a little library, um, Chelsea, um, the Chelsea Library in Michigan. Um, they have a photographer in that town named R Ralph Gunther. He was an active photographer from the 1950s to the early 2000s. And following his retirement, he his negatives were donated to the Chelsea District Library. Um, Ralph was pretty a pretty famous guy in that town. I think he took pictures of everybody. <laughs> uh, he took pictures when they were born, when they got married, uh, the whole the whole gamut. And what was interesting when he donated those negatives that most of those negatives didn't have subjects names attached to them, so they didn't know who those folks were. It's kind of like looking at a yearbook without any without any names. So they reached out to the community to identify who all these unnamed subjects were, and the outcome was was great. You know, you had people coming in saying, "Yes, I remember her. I dated her. Or I took her to my senior prom." Or, um, "Yeah, I used to play baseball with that kid." Um, and it, they they were able to identify the subjects' names in these collections, which I think was pretty neat process. Um, San Antonio is coming up on their tricentennial, and they're doing some pretty interesting things. They're looking for um, they're looking for audio, video, images, uh, ephemera that they have over the past three hundred years from San Antonio, and um, making that trying to make that available. They have a, a portal, which I'll show you in a few minutes, where they've reached out to the community and said, give us all your stuff. And they're starting to collect that stuff so that they can uh, curate it and make it available. They happen to be making that available on Biblioboard, which I think is fantastic. There, there, are all, they also have a, there are also many, many other libraries that are doing things from digit, digitizing yearbooks and homecoming programs. There's a couple libraries that have um, programming every week, lots and lots of programming in the library, which I know you guys probably fall into that boat too. And they've decided that they're going to video that programming and make that programming available in a nice collection so patrons can access that in the event that they can't make it to the physical programming day. Uh, so some, some pretty interesting things are going on. Uh, Veranda didn't really mention uh, pop-up picks. Uh, Veranda, do you want to talk about that or would you like for me to? Oh, go ahead, since you're calling me out and making me look bad to my members. Go ahead. Well, I don't want to call you out, but Pop-Up Picks <laughs> is this great, great program that I can't, I can't do justice that Barada would do for it. But um, with, in partnership with Rails and Biblioboard, we, we um, worked with IPG, the Independent Publishing Group, and we've, we've found um, really front list, fantastic collections of books, between 70 and 100 books, that are available for a short period of time. It turns out that the short period of time is about 90 days. And these are available for unlimited simultaneous use. Um, so there's fantastic books. They're also um, there are books that the front list or that IPG is making available in the hopes that it draws discovery for other content that they have. So it's a fantastic program. I think of it, it ties into engaging your community a little bit with the, the community reads aspect. And that is that all of the content that you have with Biblioboard kind of works like pop-up picks in the sense that it's available to your members at unlimited, unlimited simultaneous use. Um, it doesn't pop down every 90 days like it will from IPG, but um, the, the pop-up picks program is incredible and something that we're really, really excited about. IPG is the largest independent publishing um, company, so they're doing some great things and, and being willing to work with a company that wants to deliver content in an unlimited simultaneous use fashion is pretty groundbreaking. So it's something that 
I know I'm excited about. I think all of the members of Rails and patrons of libraries in Illinois should be pumped about it. Um, so on to um, the next slide. There, I, we believe at BiblioBoard that usage matters. I, I apologize to all the librarians that I pulled this from cartoon stock, but I just couldn't help myself. I like that she took all the magazines um, and paper mache your likeness and repeatedly stabbed you from waiting in the, in the doctor's office. Um, we believe that there are that, that usage, user experience matters, and we, I think about that and in, in, uh, in, it's three pronged. The first is you shouldn't have to have holds and weights on electronic content. You know, if I tried to explain to my five year old that he couldn't watch The Cat in the Hat on Netflix because somebody else was watching it he would look at me like I had three heads. Um, we also believe that patrons should be able to access ebooks, videos, audio, and images all on a single platform. We shouldn't have to ship them out to five or six different places just to see different types of media. Um, and lastly, we think that mobile matters. The Pew Research Center shows that nearly half of those who visited the public library in the past year used handheld mobile devices such as smartphones or tablets. We think that, program, that, that um, content should be delivered um, mobile, particularly with digital natives. You know, you, 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 you try to do something, you make something difficult for a digital native, they're going to walk away. So those are kind of the principles for what we believe at BiblioBoard. Um, we're committed to the long-term success of the library. We continue to innovate on their behalf to help them thrive in the digital age. We believe that user experience matters and we created a consumer grade platform where all the content is available for unlimited simultaneous use, no holds or checkouts, and we're a completely mobile company, although we, our, 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 our um, platform is available, is also web based. Um, and we've worked really, really hard to create services um, to help you engage your local communities. And I think we've done a good job with it and we're going to continue to innovate uh, on your behalf to bring new programs that help you engage your community. Um, can you skip a, a couple slides, Amanda, and go to the um, selfie slide? Thanks. So, um, so Michelle talked a little bit about selfie, and I know Jeffrey did too, and I, I don't, I can't see by show of hands or anything, but you guys may or may not be aware of this program. A couple of years ago, we partnered with Library Journal and created a program called Selfie, and the, the, this program is designed to help the library engage their local writing community. So when an author comes in the library and says, hey, put my book on the shelf, you can say, sure thing. Here's a link to Selfie. Go here and upload your ebook. Um, library Journal will take a look at it and they'll review it for you even. And they'll say if it's an LJ Select book, which about 10% of the books that we receive through the LJ submission platform are, um, are LJ Select books or it's not a select book. If it is a selected book, it will be available for distribution around the world for anybody that has access to the BiblioBoard platform. Um, if it's not selected by LJ, that's okay too. There are good books out there. We have a pretty high bar on the LJ Select, and those books would still be available for consumption um, in the state of Illinois. So, and since Illinois is geolocated, everybody would have access to it in that state. Um, so it's a great opportunity to get exposure for the authors, but it also allows you as a librarian to kind of figure out, you know, what are the 10% of the books that are indie that are coming through are good as determined by library journals. So you can deliver that content up first to your patrons. Um, the, the next piece is one of the things that I've found is that um, authors are really good at writing. That's what they want to do. But what they're not so good at is formatting the interior or the cover of their book. I completely get that. At that same conference I was talking about, we had an author stand up who was the um, he was the indie publishing specialist, and he told a crowd of about sixty authors that it was going to cost them between eight and fifteen thousand dollars to format the interior and cover their book. And I, in the back of the room, at that point, I just really didn't want to say too much about it. But that's not accurate. You can spend that much money. But uh, when I was at Amazon, we were charging about $1,500 to $2,000 to format your interior and your cover, and that was incredibly competitive. Um, but we found this program called Pressbooks, 
and um, we we press we work with Pressbooks and partner to deliver a program called uh, the, the program is called Pressbooks Public, and what it does is it allows you as an author to simply take your Word doc, you can either copy it and paste and paste it into uh, Pressbooks. Or if you're so inclined and it's NaNoWriMo and you have space in your library where authors are actually writing books, they can actually write in the platform of Pressbooks. After that book is completed, um, you know you can select a cover, you can select themes that you'd like to choose or that you that you'd like for your book, um, and then you have a fully you click export and you have a fully formatted PDF or EPUB. You also can take that, at that point, you can take that book and, and click a button and say, upload this to Selfie. Uh, you can also download that file and you can take that file to CreateSpace or Ingram Spark or any of the self-publishing companies and you can upload that file. Like with CreateSpace, you can upload that file for free. So that eliminates the cost for that author going to CreateSpace. They can upload a fully formatted PDF and have that book available print on demand and they can also take that same Mobi or EPUB file and have that book available through Kindle Direct Publishing and it doesn't cost the author anything. And the price of press books is incredibly competitive um, which I'm happy to talk about. I, I can just say that it's the, the, the price of press books for a library, um, even a large library, is less than that of what one author would pay to format their books. So you could have it available for every author in your community. It's a really cool program and one that from a cost perspective is saving patrons a, a ton of money. Um, lastly, we have a program called um, Creator. And so this, you know, Selfie and Pressbooks are really focused on the authors in your communities. But what about the world, you know, the folks with oral histories or the archivist or the musicians in your community. And so we have a program called Selfie that we are um, incredibly, I'm sorry, called Creator that we're incredibly proud of. And um, this program just allows you to receive content from your community, much like you're receiving uh, self-published books today, and then can curate those on the back end and deliver those on um, BiblioBoard for consumption uh, by your patrons. So it's a cool product. I can show you quickly just a couple of the portals and then show you BiblioBoard so you can get a sense of what it, what it looks like. So while um, Jamie pulls that up, um, I just wanted to say back to pop-up picks, I'd encourage all of you to check it out. It's a great resource to attract new users to the library because it's, it gives them a taste of what kind of resources they could have. I'd strongly encourage people taking a look at the titles to see how you can incorporate them into programming because as people are sitting in a particular program in your library or wherever you are, not even in the library, you can have them download it right then and everyone could be looking at the same title, the same page as it refers to a particular program. So go ahead, Jamie. Sorry about that. No, that's okay. Yeah, thank you. Um, so this is a St. Charles Public Library in Illinois. This is their, their website. You can see here that they have um, Selfie from Library Journal, Indie Illinois module, they have Pressbooks Public. So if I were going to come to uh, this page and I was an author um, and I wanted to submit my book, I'd simply come here, I'd click on um, Selfie. I've got this branded page that talks about the Selfie program. and um, I can begin to uh, upload my content. So here I can say submit their ebook. If I click here, I simply go to a, what I call a, a portal. And if my internet comes up. So um, this portal, you can, um, you know, it's, it's branded for St. Charles Public Library. There's a button here to submit your book. There's information about submitting your book, what sort of file is needed to submit that book. Uh, it needs to be in English language right now. We're not we're not able to review books in in other languages at this point. It's something that we should bring out quickly, or, or should be doing next. I wouldn't say quickly, um, but um, once you submit your book, we say we, we really try to um, under promise and over deliver here. We're really able to notify customers within a week, but we say here four to six weeks just in case we have, you know, um, a big backlog or something. But we'll we'll notify the author 
at that point. But you can simply submit your book, and you go to this page where it'll ask you, like, you have to agree to the terms and conditions. Michelle mentioned that it's um, it's a royalty-free program, but it's also a non-exclusive program, meaning that um, you're not tied. You can, this, Selfie is not the only place you can distribute this book. Uh, you can have it available on Ingram Spark, CreateSpace, Selfie, uh, any place, KDP, any place that you wanted to have it, you can do it. Um, but um, anyway, you go through this this process. You accept the terms and conditions, and I won't go through all of it because because it's pretty easy. Um, you enter your personal information, including the metadata of the book. Um, you upload the file. Sorry, you upload the file, general information, and the details of your book, and then you can review and submit it. That book is goes directly to um, um, to comes to Biblio Labs. We take a look at it just to make sure it's a book, um, and then uh, we send that over to Library Journal where they read the book and they review the book and they either give it a when I say review, they're either giving it a, an LJ Select stamp or not giving an LJ Select stamp. After the book is submitted, uh, the book goes into an Indiana, Indy, Illinois collection, which is available um, almost instantly. And this is what it looks like on BiblioBoard. So I, obviously I'm on the web right now, but if I were on my phone or on the iPad, I could just click in Indy, Illinois, and I can explore titles from, ah, been kicked out. Sorry, bear with me one second. I can um, explore collections within the in, in Illinois. So if I want to read a thriller, um, I'm interested in reading Indy, Illinois thrillers today, I can come in here and just start reading. Um, this, this controlled descent is highlighted, meaning that it's been selected by Library Journal, and it also will end up in the LJ Select um, um, module, which I'll show you in a minute. But I can click in and I can start reading it. If I'm on my device, I tap in. I've got uh, page turning with your finger that you would expect. Um, and anyhow, I can, I can go through the pages. Uh, I've got this icon up here so I can actually do a search within the book if I'd like. I can make a bookmark. I can leave notes. Um, I can go into the details of the book if I'd like right here. Um, I can also buy this book in print. So um, if the author, obviously this author said, yeah, I'd like to drive people to buy my book if they'd like, or it could also take, you know, if you go to an Amazon page, which you probably do, um, you can also see, like, other books that might be in a series. So pretty, pretty neat thing. Um, we also have um, uh, Pressbooks Public. So Pressbooks, once you get into Pressbooks, it's pretty straightforward, but you can actually either go ahead and paste your book here, or you can uh, start typing your book if you'd like to. Um, you can enter, you, you enter your book information here. Um, so you have, this is my test book, the author is Katie Davis. Um, you enter all the metadata that you have here. I, I can go to my theme options. So if I'm, if I'm writing a, um, let me go to themes. If I'm writing a book that's, um, I don't know, it's, um, let's call it a thriller. It tells me what these are. These are the thriller themes. I can say that I like this one, and I want to activate this theme. Uh, so my book then shows up like that thematically, and I can um, I can simply export this book at this point, and um, I can export my book, and I have an EPUB. Uh, you can also go to publish, and under publish, I can submit directly to Selfie. So if I want to submit this book here. I come to a page where I can I say I'm still missing some book information um, as I go through this quickly, but I just fill that out, submit the selfie. I say I want to be eligible for selfie select. It's really intuitive and easy to use, and I'm, for anybody on the call that would like to have a, a kind of a detailed demo or more training on that, I'm, I'm happy to do that. I, I recognize I'm going through this um, pretty quickly. Um, we talked a little bit about um, the creator also. So like um, Louisville, Hunter S. Thompson is from uh, Louisville, Kentucky, and they have a, a, a literary journalism award contest every year called the Gonzo Fest. And so this is a way that they actually get those books from the community. It's very similar to the selfie page, 
um, but they're asking for literary works and they have a deadline of when these can be submitted. So um, you submit your book, there's some details about what that book needs to look like and um, this is part of our creator package. So you get these portals that come with that, like the tricentennial. Um, they're doing things in San Antonio, which is a little more than just one media type. They're asking for everything, right? They're saying invite local residents to submit photos, documents, oral histories, videos, and other digital ephemera to commemorate the city's storied history. They want it. They want it all, right? It, it does say submitting your book right here. Um, I, we need to change that. That's that's I'll make I'll make that change. But you can um, there's like a uh, there's a, a user agreement an end user agreement that says that uh, you're giving the library the right to take this uh, content. You have the rights to the content. You're giving the library the rights to uh, present that content. So it's it's a really easy thing. I mean, you can imagine you put this out to your musical community and say, hey, look, give us your stuff, and um, then it comes into Biblia Board and on the back end. You can create these really nice looking um, digital exhibits that are available right on your home page um, of, of your instance of Biblia Board. So here we have the Indy, Illinois books. We also have these LJ Select collections. So these are books from not just the state of Illinois, but from all over the country and the world, frankly, that are, um, that are selected by library journals. So you know, when I go back to that stat about urban fiction or the number of best-selling books, these are written by authors like Hugh Howey and El Penelope who have really good collections. You get access to that. Um, this is what Louisville Mix looks like now, just to show you that one. Um, we can have collections of content that we build in here. I think I showed this one yesterday. Uh, this is like a bluegrass collection, so you can go in and, and listen to this music. Uh, you might not be able to hear it. But uh, and, uh, I can easily switch songs. I can pause it. You know, I can, there, it's just a really, really intuitive experience um, from Louisville Mix. Um, I can also see some of these oral histories. So Brooklyn Public Library uh, did a, a neat project about uh, Brooklyn in the Civil War. So you know, you can go in and check out. Uh, their collection on slavery in Brooklyn in the Civil War. There's like this is a good example of where you have multiple media types all side by side. You can imagine in that Louisville Mix collection if they had a poster of the band or an interview with the band or a music video of the band along with the audio of the band. That's completely easy to do within Bibliovore because it's not media specific. Um, Anyway, I've gone through, gone through that pretty quickly for the sake of time, and I also want to see if you guys have any questions that I might be able to answer. Oh, Michelle. Um, Jamie, I was wondering, do you think that you guys could put together, like, presentations about um, press books for patrons that we could use as part of programming? Or have yeah. you already? And I, because we don't have press books, and that's something I'm interested in. We have we um, we put a video together, which is it's really it's it's an incredibly helpful video, um, and I can send that to you, and I can send that to okay. everybody on this. I can send it to Veranda, and Veranda, you can send it out to everybody. Can distribute it mm -hmm. to attendees from yesterday and today. Because I'm always looking for free or inexpensive programming. <laughs> Um, okay, my other things are, one, um, could, could you speak to, uh, last I knew there was beta testing on usage in Selfie so that local authors could see who was using our, our statistics on usage. And then also I wanted to mention that there's um, a badgeification program. So if you are a local author and you do get selected by LJ for the National Collection, they give you like a little badge that you can use yeah. for your book. Yeah, thank you, thank you for that, Michelle. Yeah, we absolutely do that, and we we also invite um, we invite the finalist in the LJ um, uh, Selfie Select Awards to join us at ALA Midwinter every year, and we host a reception for them. So I know Veranda attended that this year, 
and it's always it's it's always great. We have the the winners couldn't be more excited about being there, um, and it's great to get that. It's that the, the badge is very meaningful to them, and the exposure is incredibly meaningful for them. In regards to the um, to the usage, yes, and I I I'm expecting that it should be any day now that we have this. Um, this uh, we have usage statistics that we can supply the authors with that tell them how many times their book has been um, has been read and where that book has been read. I think we're we may not be so specific as to the actual library. I think we're trying to figure that out, but we may just tell them which state um, where the books have been read. Obviously, we don't know who's reading it. We don't you know we don't collect any uh, any information about who's reading what. But um, we know where it's being read, and so I think that will be really meaningful and help with um, how the authors think about growing their readership. That should be coming really, really soon, if not this week, you know, very soon. And I'll make sure that I get that to you first thing. Oh, that's that's really great. I think um, local authors will appreciate that. That will oh, be yeah. helpful. Yeah, and no just. So anything else? I was just going to wrap up with a couple things, Jamie. Yeah, no, that's all from me, Veronica. I don't, okay, I um, don't, oh, and you saw Jeffrey, um, so so Jeffrey just had a comment about it, too, about Pressbooks, and I'll share that a little bit later. I can't see it, it's too small. Um, but I wanted to thank everyone for joining us, and if you have questions, we can put you in touch with Jamie after this webinar if you have specific questions for him. If you're interested in pricing, you can contact us here at Rails. Amanda shared her email and we're happy to give you uh, pricing for your library um, and talk with you. Uh, there will be a recording of this webinar available. That will go out to all participants if you want to share it internally to help you with your decision making process or whatever you just want to tell people about it. Um, so again, thank you everyone for joining us, and again, please let us know if you have any questions, and we appreciate you uh, joining us for this webinar. Yeah, thank so you. thank you too, Jamie, and thank you, Jeffrey and Michelle. Thank you, guys. Thank you. Have a good day, you guys. Bye.